Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Crossroads, uh, the second service of the day. It's always a joy to be with you, and I want to welcome those who are watching at home. I heard that at the last service, we had uh, triple the numbers on the church app in addition to the social media, so a special welcome to those who are watching at home, and you could stay connected through the week with our Crossroads Church app and the daily devotion that comes out each morning. We want to keep you encouraged as you go through the week. Um, as you can see, we did a little decorating for you today for the VBS. And you know what? I was thinking about this between the services. It kind of goes good with our psychedelic ceiling that we have above. We didn't paint that for this week. You know, that, that's the building, as you know, it's a historical building. It's landmark. But it kind of goes with the theme of the space theme for the kids. I was thinking about that. So, uh, so we're, you know, top to bottom, and we got some more stuff that'll be coming out. But I'm so thankful for the, those who have already volunteered and those who will be this week. And if you'd like to, to join us, you could be praying. And if you know any kids that you want to bring over, you can. You just got to take them back and pick them up after the, the camp's over. But, but uh, glad that you're with us. I want to invite you to take out your Bible and your message outline so you could follow right along. We're continuing our journey through the book of John, this great gospel of John. As we said, you know, when John wrote this, uh, he wasn't journaling. And as he was going, he was taking notes. Um, he wrote this gospel uh, much later. And so he writes it with the perspective, of course, of the resurrection. And so we've been working our way from the back to the front. We've come as far as chapter 8. And as we approach uh, this important real estate here in the Scripture, what we're going to see is that a group of religious leaders, namely the scribes and the Pharisees, they test Jesus' commitment to the Old Testament as well as his compassion for people, most likely underlining people normally, and they're trying to entrap him, if you will, and they bring an adulterous woman, we're told, who was caught in the act, put her, puts her right in front of him. And the Lord's merciful and, let me note, unprecedented response flips the script on their prideful agenda and puts into full view the mercy of Almighty God. And each and every one of us needs to realize that we need to live with a merciful mindset. And so I want to talk with you today about getting into a mindset of mercy. And let me begin by just asking you a question. Is the world getting nicer or meaner? What would you say? I thought so. That's what the last service said. And I'm uh, not that I'm a betting man, but I'm willing to say that the next service will say that as well. The world and this uh, satanic system is getting meaner by the moment. And that has some residual on you and I. It could affect how we treat people, how we view people, and even how we view ourselves. And so what I want you to know is, is that we, we serve and we pray and we gather here today before a merciful God who cares for you and I greatly. And there are direct verses about that in the Bible. And then there are stories like this here in John chapter 8, that put the mercies of God front and center. And so without any further ado, turn with me to John chapter 8, starting in verse 1. And um, here we begin, and it says this. Again, John, an eyewitness, if you're new to the Bible, um, if you're new to the gospel of John, John's an eyewitness to all of this. We'll, we'll repeat that constantly throughout this series as we've been going through this gospel. But it says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and you know, this kind of tells us the, the ge geographical location as well as really uh, the chronological timeline of Christ, but I believe that's ancillary uh, to the story. It's, it's, uh, it's secondary, and let's get to the primary here. Verse 2 says, at, thaw, at dawn he went to the temple again, and it says, and all the people were coming to him. Now, before we go any further, it's important to realize that, you know, people were drawn to Jesus. And normally and naturally, we think, well, because of the miracles, right? We saw that last week with John chapter 9 and the healing of the man born blind and obviously the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And so certainly that, that brought a number of people to him. But those are the wonders of Christ. But don't ever discount the word of Christ because people were not only coming to, to see the wonders, they were coming to hear him teach because he has the words of life because his words literally set people free, not just from disease, not even just from death, but from whatever bondage they might be captivated in. And so it says this, they came to him. Now the next part tells us, 
something of a tradition. It says, he sat down and began to teach them. Uh, that's in keeping with Jewish rabbinical style of instructing. The teacher sits down or the presenter sits down, the rabbi sits down and everybody stands up. Maybe we'll try that next week. I'll get a nice lazy boy and I'll sit down. Everybody stands up. Uh, we're not going to do that. Don't worry. But he sat down and he began to teach. Now, verse three, if anybody's ever taught any type of lesson, whether it be in school or church or anywhere else, or, or for your job, you're an instructor, um, you don't like to be interrupted, okay? Look what verse three says. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Yes, you're hearing that right. He's in the middle of teaching, and, and poor Jesus, if you think about it, he's already had a man drop through a ceiling into the middle of his lesson. And now here comes a woman who the Bible tells us John, again, an eyewitness, was caught in adultery. So she was in the, the act of adultery, and the scribes and the Pharisees were told, uh, they apprehend her, if you will, and they bring her. I imagine she was kicking and screaming, and they bring her right to where Jesus is teaching. Now, let's just uh, look at this verse first for a second. Let's get to know some of these characters here. Um, the scribes uh, are mentioned first. You know, the scribes were sometimes called the lawyers, they were considered to be experts of the Pentateuch, the law of Moses, and they were usually, but not always, Pharisees. Now, who were the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees were an influential uh, religious sect within Judaism. According to first century Jewish historian Josephus, during the times of Herod the Great, there were approximately 6,000 of them. They wielded the most influence. Financially speaking, they were like a middle-class type people. They were known for their adherence to the law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah. But somewhere along the line, um, fitting for their name, uh, they started to separate themselves from that. And as I've mentioned before, uh, there are uh, over 600 Hebrew letters in the Ten Commandments. They took every one of those letters and they made them a commandment. So religion in their time, at the time of Christ in the early church, was very cumbersome, and that's an understatement, that's to say the least. And so uh, these Pharisees, um, they, they had a commitment to the Pentateuch, the, the first five books of the Bible, but they also had a commitment to their oral traditions, their man-made commands. And over time, their man-made commands actually superseded the Bible. And so that produced naturally a religiosity, a self-righteousness. Again, the word Pharisee in Hebrew means separated. They, they, they had this elitist mentality in their mind that they were better than people. And, and that obviously produced a certain amount of frustration and um, really a disenchantment of people with God overall. But nevertheless, this is the crew, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they coalesce and they bring a woman who the Bible says, again, was caught in adultery. Now, I just have a question for you. They just brought the woman. Where's the man? Just saying. <laughs> Takes two for adultery, doesn't it? So, so a man and a woman. So, so where is the man? How come they just brought the woman? That begins to tell you their agenda before John even gives us the backstory. They are not interested in divine judgment or justice or anything of that nature, because yes, according to the law um, in Leviticus 2010, to be exact, it, it talks about God's uh, prohibits and his prohibitations of adultery. So, so they're right in that respect, but they have an agenda. They're not looking for anybody to, to be exposed. Uh, they're looking to entrap Jesus. And let's explain how. If Jesus says, yes, let's stone the woman, well, then he's not the compassionate savior that everybody thinks he is. But if he says, don't stone the woman, he's violating the Old Testament. How could he possibly be from God? So this is the plan they've cooked up. Are you with me so far? They're trying to entrap Jesus. And no, this isn't a Lifetime movie. This really did happen. And so John then tells us, he continues the story in verse 5, this is what they say to Jesus. In the law of Moses, he commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? In other words, what say you? Verse six, now John the eyewitness says, they ask this to what? To trap him. That's their agenda because they're completely filled with their pious self-righteousness. And again, John gives us this detail. 
You think about the Gospel of John, we told you this before, 18,658 words that are transliterated over from the manuscript to the English, 679 verses, 21 chapters. Every bit of it is inspired by God, including this portion of Scripture, because God wants us to know his perspective on the matter, especially as it pertains to someone who might be caught in something. Now, unless this is the perfect service, how many of you have ever been caught in a sin? Okay, anybody ever sinned before? And if you don't raise your hand, you just lied. You just sinned, okay? So you're on the hook either way. Better be transparent, okay? Everybody's been caught in something. And what happens when you're caught in something? What's God's perspective? Well, it's building towards that. So they ask this to trap him, John tells us, in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. Now, why are they trying to accuse Jesus? And by the way, when you have an accusatory mindset, who's that like? The enemy, because that's his nickname. He's the accuser of the brethren, okay? That's not a good company to be in. But why are they trying to accuse Jesus? Well, Jesus is bad for their business. Why is he bad for their business, you might say? Well, the Pharisees hold, again, as we said earlier, according to historical records and even the, 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 the scriptures and historical document as well, they wielded the most religious and really political power. And so they feel Jesus is a threat to that we got to whack him. We got to get him out of the way. We're going to do it one way or the other. And then the other thought was, well, that if his followers rise up, he'll cause a revolt, and then we'll have the Romans on our back. So we need to do something about this Jesus problem, because his popularity is not going down. It's getting bigger by the minute. So we need to do something about it. And so they're trying every which way. Eventually, they're going to they're going to ultimately uh, lead this to get this all the way to the crucifixion. But they're trying to come at it in any type of way they can, and they're trying to discredit and disprove him in the minds of people. And so they're trying to accuse him. Now, while all this is going on, Jesus doesn't yell, curse, bite, scream, or anything like that. It says, because they're asking this question, what do you say? And it says that Jesus asked Siri what to do. No, it doesn't say that, or Google. As everybody does. We don't want to tie our shoes anymore. We ask the internet, but it doesn't say that. Look what it says. Jesus stooped down, and he started writing on the ground with his finger. Now, there's lots of debate on what he was actually writing. And I don't think we need to, you know, we need to camp out at one position. It's private because our life with God and those intricate details of our life, including our failures, are to be private until they're producing a testimony. And so he starts writing on the ground with his finger. Verse 7 says, when they persisted in questioning him, he then stood up and he said to them, the one, I think this is a profound response. That's why I said, I label this in the snapshot as being, in, in your notes, as being unprecedented. Because, again, they're trying to get him for either violating the law of the Old Testament or being a fraud as it pertains to compassion, okay? That's very important to the context here of what he's about to say. It says this. He said, the one without sin, finish it with me, among you should be the first to throw the stone at her. Okay, you want to do this? Want to do this right now? He says, in other words, Step right up. It's kind of like being at the carnival and somebody's in the tank and the bullseye's there. Okay, step right up. Who wants to go first? He who is without sin. He who has never, and it could also read, he who has no adultery in their life. Because he's already expanded the understanding of adultery, hasn't he? He said it's not just physical if you even think of it in your mind. That's not good either, okay? So he who's without sin. You step up first. He who has no adultery in their mind or their heart. He who's not living in any habitual sin, okay, you great scribes and Pharisees who we need to build a monument or a statue of, you step up first and you do it. Then he stooped down again and he continued writing on the ground. What is he writing? Now, again, this is my opinion, what I'm going to tell you. Um, I think it had to do with them. Uh, was it their sins? It could be. When you get to heaven, you could ask Jesus. There's probably a lot of other questions you could ask him. Well, before that, we're going to be there for eternity, so you need to have a list, okay? Um, you need to have a list. But was he writing their sins down? Was he writing who they were with, committing adultery with? I don't know. But it was enough to disarm them. What do we mean by that? They have stones in hand, 
in the throwing position, ready to fire one right in the square of her, her head. They are ready to go. They are, they are armed and ready. Verse 9, well, what happens? When they heard this. Now, what does that phrase mean? I thought he was writing. Shouldn't it read when he sees this? What does that mean? Well, when you study the grammar of this, it gives us the idea that the ground is speaking. Now, you might say, wait a minute. What do you mean the ground is speaking here? Well, I don't mean the ground is, is speaking audibly, but I believe what he was writing supernaturally was reverberating in their heart. They heard him loud and clear. They were what we call convicted. Now, we don't like to talk about that too much. We just want to come to church. We want to be entertained, right? We want to, be, we want to laugh. We want to giggle. We want to smile. We want to make the place like a club, and we want to be entertained till we drop dead. But he, he didn't send a showman. He sent a savior because his people need some saving. That's why. And so he says these things, and when they heard this, they were convicted in their heart. And that, that's a work of God. It's, it's possible to be stopped in your tracks and your self-righteousness. And then this is what happened next. It says one by one they left, and they, they dropped their, their stones on the floor. That's what happened. They dropped it. Where my stones go? Oh, here they go. Here they go. There's one right over here. I got, oh, I need this one. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't worry about it. They had the stones ready to go. They were ready to roll with the stone. This is the equivalency, because this is a weapon. This is the equivalency of there being a bunch of people with guns focused on one person, and somebody disarms them, and they don't have a gun themselves. What in the world did they just say? Well, it had to be something more than something just for them to hear. It had to be something to change their heart and their mind. Because he's got the words of life, that's why. Because he's greater than any religious system that they've cooked up to, to condemn this woman. That's why. And so then he stooped down again. Let me read it again. Continued writing on the ground. And when they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older one. Now, why with the older one? What's up with that? Because I think as the older you get, the less prideful you get. You know, when you're young, you think you can walk on water. You do stupid things. You think you know everything. When you have a little more mileage under your belt, you know, it, life humbles all of us. Let's just say it that way. Mistakes we make, tragedies we go through, it just changes our perspective. And it, it's, not, it's, it's not a slight on anybody who's younger. We've all been there, and maybe you're there right now, and life will do that to you. And if you process it the right way, it'll be a blessing. And if you don't, it'll become, you'll become bitter, so you want to process it the right way. But they, they, they drop their stones, and their perspective needs to change doesn't it? Because they've, they've brought this woman before Jesus, and they have an agenda. They're driven by their self-righteousness. So you might want to jot this down here in your notes, and here it is. If you're going to get into a mindset of mercy, listen, if you're going to be mercifully minded, let's say it that way too, you, you need to address any self-righteous attitude. See, self-righteousness will become a barrier to you, how you view people, and then we'll see in just a moment how you view God and how he views you. So this becomes a hinge principle. Now, self-righteousness is like bad breath. You notice it on other people, but you don't notice it on yourself. So you might want to go handing out Tic Tacs and gum and everything else and drink water and go, oh, look at that, I probably forgot to brush your teeth. What might be people saying about you? if you're self-righteous. Oh, but I do this for the church and I do that and I do this. Okay, here, we, there you go. We gave it to you. There you go. That's what you want. That's what you're looking for. We need to be careful here. It could happen to anybody. It happened to the Pharisees. I mean, they know, they, they have the first five books of the Bible memorized for crying out loud, okay? Uh, who knows more than them? The scribes, the experts. It's possible for anybody to become pious and to pick up their stones. And so we want to address any self-righteousness that we might have, because we might be too busy looking at everybody else. And if we're not careful, it could do us in. See, we don't want to settle for religious righteousness. The Bible doesn't say to do that. Look what it says in Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Jesus said it this way. Why don't we say this verse together aloud, together. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never... The kingdom of heaven. Never. Why is that? Wait a minute. I thought I did this good. I did that good. Let's be very clear. When it comes to our spiritual bank account, 
we're in the negative. I think all of us at one time or another, you were in tough times financially, and uh, that eerie feeling of being in the negative, in <laughs> the account, it's not a good feeling. It's not a good feeling spiritually either. So we're in the negative, but the, the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the church at Rome says that God in his, God in his goodness and his mercy, he deposited righteousness in your account and my account. Let me explain how that would feel, uh, just a little bit of how that would feel. Uh, how many of you have a smartphone, by the way? Okay. Hope you have the church app downloaded, by the way. Uh, but, uh, how many of you bank from your, your, your phone? What's your password? No, I'm just kidding. We're just kidding. <laughs> That's another church. We don't do that. We don't do it. We're just kidding with that. What would happen right now if you got a notification on your phone and it read that somebody deposited $5 million in your account? Wait a minute, that was not planned. That, 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 you know, that, that's, that's, yeah. now, now, <laughs> the, before, now, before we go any further, for that person in silence their phone, if you could come back to the next service and do that again, that would be very appreciated. And if you're watching from home, that's why you got to come in person. You miss these things. So if you got that notification right now, there'd probably be a few hallelujahs. Somebody might collapse. You have to get the church nurse to revive you, okay? Uh, it would be amazing. Let me tell you something. God has put more than a million dollars or $5 million in your account. He has imputed grace, mercy, forgiveness, and eternal life into your account. And there is no religious steps that you and I could take, no fun we could give to, uh, nothing we could manufacture, uh, no version of emotional Christianity that we could ever take that would do that for me and for you. Because only Christ was fitting and allowed to fulfill the prophecies. Only Christ was the one who went, was able to go to the cross. Only Christ was the one that was able to be the sacrificial lamb. Only Christ was the one who went to the cross to die for my sins and your sins. And the greatest news of all is not only did he die for our sins, he rose from the dead. He's today seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven. And so the last thing you would ever wanna do is settle for religious righteousness because that will just put your account more in the negative. And you need your account to be in the positive, spiritually speaking. Address any self-righteous attitude because mercy is the family business. For those of you who may have worked in a company or even in your own family's company, you know, it's the family business, right? You know what the family business of the church is and of God? Mercy. How do we know that? Look what Dr. Luke wrote in his gospel. In Luke chapter 6, verse 36, another verse to commit to memory. Why don't we say this verse together aloud? Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So we're reflecting God Almighty. We don't want to be busy pointing out everybody else's flaws when we got issues in our own life. Before we move on to the next section of verses, it reminds me of a story I heard about a man who was traveling for business. He was going to a conference and he rented a car. He was on his way to the convention center, and he had a heavy foot, to say the least, and somebody in front of him was also driving fast, and the guy was just flying by, and he didn't like that, so he's speeding along. So he actually calls up the police while he's on the phone, while he's driving, and he says, I'd like to report a man speeding in his car. He's going at least 120 miles per hour. He goes, here's his license plate. Cop says, thank you very much. He goes, um, may I ask what your license plate is? Man's surprised. He goes, why do you need my license plate for? He goes, well, if he's doing 120 and you can see his license plate, you must be doing 110. <laughs> he's 70 miles over the speed limit, okay, and, and you're 60 over. Click, he hung up on him. That's how we are with God. We want to point out everybody else's flaws and mistakes and this and that. Well, what about our speed, okay? What about what we're doing? The Pharisees are so controlled by their self-righteous agenda that the mercy of God is staring them right in the face and they're missing it. They have spiritual cataracts, if you will, because 
of your self-righteousness. Let that never be said of me and you. That's the Pharisees. Now, what about this woman? It says that they left, and they left their artillery behind. As you flip over your notes, we go to the second part of verse 9, and we'll take it to the, the middle of verse 11. It says, only he was left. Let me just tell you, you want to live to the audience of one, Jesus Christ. All the, everything else is noise. That doesn't in any way minimize what this woman was doing, and Jesus doesn't do that either. Obviously, adultery is, God has statements on that, very clear statements on that, whether it be the Old or the New Testament. Obviously, uh, faithfulness needs to happen in the context of relationship between a man and a woman. God's very clear on these things. No matter who tries to change things to fit a narrative or a lifestyle or a habit, th this is what God said. And either, either we're going to go all in and believe that this is God's word. It doesn't matter if I agree with it or not. A lot of times, obedience precedes understanding anyway. And so he in no way is minimizing this. Nobody should be, or anything for that matter, nobody should be caught up in anything. We should be living free. He set us free from these things. But before we get to that, it says only he was left with her, with the woman in the center. Now, again, John's an eyewitness. John tells us she's still in the center. What does that mean? This woman was probably shaking. She was taken, they probably had to throw you know, something on her, a garment or something. She was caught in the act. Again, they left the guy there. Because again, they're not interested in any type of justice. The guy's off the hook. They bring her because maybe she was easy to restrain. She probably went kicking, screaming, and biting everything else. She's still in the center. She hasn't went to the back or the front, to the left or the right. She's left there with Jesus. Verse 10, when Jesus stood up, he said to her, woman. Now, don't get caught up in that. Um, that term is a term of endearment. Um, it could mean my dear, Okay. Uh, my dear, where are they? He's speaking of everybody who had their stones ready to go and throw them at her. Has no one condemned you? Now, this is a rhetorical question, right? Um, but she can answer. No one. Now, notice what she says. Lord. And it's not lowercase Lord in the English, because then that would mean that it would be a different word in the manuscript. It's capital L, Lord, meaning that somewhere in this process, remember what John told us? It would take the volumes of the world to write everything that took place and happened. Somewhere in this process, this woman has been changed by the grace and mercy of Almighty God because he's not rabbi, he's not dude or anybody else. He is Lord, no one Lord. It's far more than just rabbinical style. She's went from that, and this is reverence right here. No one, Lord, she answered. And listen to this. This is profound. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. I don't condemn you either. And I think a principle emerges if you're going to have a merciful mindset. Choose to see me as God sees me. And that's an important principle. Can we say that together? Choose to see me as God sees me. Not as the world sees me. Not as, uh, the, you know, everybody with their stones ready to remind me of my past, okay? We must remember, Pharisees missed this one. He didn't come to rub our sins in our face. He came to rub them out. And when he looks at us, he doesn't see addict. He doesn't see abuser. Or he doesn't see loser. He doesn't see liar, anything like that. If you've confessed Christ as Savior, you are justified by Almighty God. And so that changes things, if you truly mean it. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord. Neither do I. We want to choose to see ourselves as God sees us. In Paul's letter to the church at Rome, he reminded them of this very fact. Why don't we say this verse together aloud as well? Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. That last phrase is what it's all about. If I'm in Christ Jesus, I don't stand condemned. I've been justified by the finishing, saving work of Christ on the cross. 
And now God is in the process of sanctifying me and my stupidity, okay? Anybody else with me, okay? Right, just one person. Oh, two people. I said, okay, all right, all right. I, can, I will not be, let me put this disclaimer out. I cannot be held responsible for what happens after this. Met. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, when you don't see yourself the way that God sees you, it distorts your vision. It's hard to go forward. Maybe you've had the experience, uh, the untimely and uh, really the unforgettable experience of being in the car when there's like a torrential downpour. Um, I had, uh, I've been in that a number of times, but perhaps the, the, the most, the scariest time was, um, I think about two or three years ago, uh, me, uh, Jen, my brother and the boys, we went to, to the Giants Fan Fest, which was a complete waste of time. I was very disappointed. They, you know, the stadium is a, is a dump anyway, but they really did very little for their fans and and you're just sitting there, and you couldn't even hear what was going on. It, it was terrible. And then to boot, when we left, there was a torrential rain on the turnpike that we were like, I don't know if we're going to make it. Because, you know, you got your hot dogs who were still speeding for some reason. Um, and all you could see was like a little bit of red in front of you. So your vision with the windshield was completely impaired until um, the storm broke. And then you were able to see. I like to think when we're caught up in a sin, it's the equivalent of having our windshield and our view of what's ahead, the road ahead, being completely and utterly obstructed. And it's hard to go forward. And I would surmise that's how this woman felt. In addition to obviously now the shame that she has experienced for being put right in the center, she has been carrying this. And see, maybe you're carrying something right now, and that's why you keep going back to the stupidity, like a dog going back to vomit, as the Bible says. You keep going back to it, or you're entrapped in it because you're not seeing yourself as God sees you, or as God wants to see you, or how he wants you to see you. It's, it's all connected. And so we got to say, God, what does your word say? What does mercy say? And here, right in this passage, Christ is balancing, he's harmonizing, if you will, divine justice and mercy right there. Because he's not, again, making little of this woman's sin, but he's not condemning her also because her faith is now where it needs to be. And so how does this tie up here? Look at this last part now here in verse 11. Look what Jesus says to her. Because yes, she's forgiven, but there is a human responsibility, isn't there? Because then mercy would just be like some trapeze net that sits under us as we go from one sin to another. Don't worry, God will catch me. Let me keep doing what I want to do. See, that's our society today. Let me do what feels right. See, actually, let me back it up. There's really two schools of thought here when it comes to all of this. Let's throw stones at people for certain sins and condemn them. Or let's pretend like it's okay, do whatever you want. Whatever feels right. Do what feels good, famous last words. I told you before, that's what the great theologian Doc Vader said, your feelings betray you. Beware of that. Don't go by what feels right, go by what God has said. What is God's best for you? For a relationship, for a business, for finances, for your time? What is God's best? Because if you do your best, you're settling. God's best is always better than our best. And God has new blessings for you to walk in and new places for you to go and new opportunities to serve. But if we're stuck, it's not gonna happen. That's why he gave us this verse here. Look what Jesus said now in verse 11, the second part of it. Finish it with me. Go and from now on, do not sin anymore. Now, what is he saying there? Stop being caught in adultery. And you won't be able to be caught in adultery if you're not committing adultery. So don't, stop with this habitual sin here. And you just fill in the blank for you, whatever it is, that God doesn't want me staying stuck because that's what happens. And so the biblical principle here that you want to um, notate here with these verses is the following. Turn away from the things that get me stuck. What might be getting you stuck right now? Obviously, it's not God's will. He still loves you. 
He still cares for you. He's still going to provide for you. He's not going to zap you with lightning. We don't need to try to guilt anybody or anything like that. But it's not his best. And it's not what he set you free for. He set you free to be faithful. He sets you free to be fearless. He sets you free to be his David when there's a Goliath. He sets you free to be a Daniel when there's a Nebuchadnezzar. He sets you free to be a Joseph when you've been falsely accused. He has set you free to be a Paul or a John or a Peter or an Esther or a Mary. He has set you and I free for holy purposes, not to stay stuck in whatever garbage he saved us out of because he loves you and I and he has plans for us. And so as we close, the story puts this into perspective before we get to our last verse. And it's about a young man who took a job as a summer intern at a company. And he accidentally, first week of the job, not a good way to start, he accidentally deleted important files that were to be accessed later in the fall for an upcoming project that the company had. He thought at first, oh no, I'm cooked, I'm done. I just started, I'm done. No way they're gonna wanna hire me after the summer. But then he thought, nobody knows. But he was mistaken. His coworker, who happened to be his friend, knew. He didn't know that until later on when his supervisor said to the both of them, I need one of you to stay after tonight. You're not getting paid, but you need to stay about two or three hours after the whistle. His friend leaned over to him and said, remember the file. And he looked at his friend and said, what? And the friend explained to him that he knew that he accidentally deleted the file. He said, remember the file. And then he says to his boss, the supervisor, I'll work tonight, no problem. Now this went on with other tasks in the office. Every time a task was given uh, to that so-called friend, he would manipulate his other friend and he would say, remember the file? And he would have to do his friend's work. And then it came to a nice weekend when everybody was going, all the summer interns were going to the beach. Somebody had to stay after and work the weekend and his friend said to him again, remember what? The file. Finally, he couldn't take it anymore. He went to his boss and he said, I got to talk with you, I got to come clean. He says, about three weeks ago, I deleted an important file and I kept it from you, but that's what I did. His boss laughed. He said, why are you laughing? He goes, I knew all about it. His boss happened to be a devout follower of Christ. He said, I knew all about it. I forgave you when you did it. And by the way, as an intern, we wouldn't trust you to have unlimited, unsupervisory access to files like that. You signed up that I would share your screen as your supervisor. When you made that mistake, I simultaneously undid it. I was just wondering how long you were going to let your friend manipulate you. I wonder if God thinks the same sometimes of us. How long are you going to let the enemy manipulate you? How long are you going to let the world manipulate you and hold you hostage when the King of kings and the Lord of lords has set you free? How much longer are you going to be the patsy and the pawn of evil when he's called you to good things? when he's prepared you for good works before the foundations of the earth, when he has a purpose for your life, even your disappointments, even your hardships, even in, like Job, the wake of tragedy. See, God wants to bless you, and I, and not with yachts and boats like the, the, the crooks talk about, but he has spiritual blessings for you and I to walk in. Holy purposes. This is a short time we have here. This is the warm-up act for heaven. And until we get there, we want to know and we want to live in the abundance. And the abundance is not material, but it's in the provision of his mercy that has set you and I free for all of eternity. Turn away from whatever might be getting you stuck and turn to the Savior 
because he's in the freedom business. All of his promises find their yes and their amen in Jesus. And there is not a religion on the face of the planet or a person or a guru in the East or any other type of version of Scientology that has the power to set you free. Only Jesus Christ could set you free from sin and death. You might think, well, I'll just accumulate a lot and I'll buy my win. No, you can't. Jesus already covered that. He said, what good is if you gain the whole world but forfeit your soul? And nobody gains the whole world. But are you willing to forfeit eternity for just a little bit of the world? Even if God does give you a lot, he's blessed you to be a blessing anyway. Turn away from the things that get me stuck because God has holy plans for you. Jesus has disarmed the rocks and now he wants you to know you're free. And so this last verse comes from John 8 as well. You know, as the chapter rolls on, he says, I'm the light of the world. In his epistle, he makes very clear, you know, if you say you have no sin, if you live in darkness, you make him out to be a liar. You gotta be transparent. If we confess our sins, he says in 1 John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to what? To forgive you of your sins. See, the enemy operates with three focus points. And don't miss this. Listen now, he's a deceiver. He wants to deceive you. He wants to tempt you. And he wants to accuse you. Revelation 12 tells us that night and day, he's accusing us before the Father. He wants to accuse you and I, and then he wants you to believe those accusations. But those accusations come from the pits of hell. Don't worry about what the enemy said or anybody else. You focus on what God has said. And so that's why Jesus says in this chapter, I'm the light of the world. And then he wraps this chapter up with this last verse in John 8, 36. Why don't we say it together? How fitting on Communion Sunday that we have this verse, but let's say it together. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Do you believe that today? That Jesus has set you free from sin and death. He wants you and I to live with a merciful, listen, mindset. You know, if our mind isn't right, we won't be right. You want to get your mind right. You want to look at people the way Jesus looks at people. Didn't Jesus say, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy? We got to carry one another's burdens. And I know what you might be thinking, well, Ray, I don't got it all together. Find me somebody that does, okay? And as we said before, we, we may not be where we want to be, but by God's mercy, we're not where we used to be either. And so we want to turn away from the garbage of this world. We want to keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus because he has set us free, free indeed. And if you ever have any doubts of that and think, well, what about I did this and I did that? Remember, he's faithful, even when we're faithless, the scripture says. His mercies renew every morning. You ever wonder why that is? Because we need some mercy, that's why. Every morning it renews. And three times on Sunday. No, but it renews every, <laughs> renews every day. We need the mercies of God. Get into a merciful mindset. And you'll, like John, be in awe of Jesus, the master teacher, who disarms those with stones aimed and ready to be thrown and puts the focus where it needs to be, which is on God Almighty. The same way he rescued this woman from her accusers is the same way he rescues every one of us. God's will, let me be clear, is not for you to be stuck in the confusion of our day. We see that. It's not to be stuck in the satanic system of our day. God's will is that you would be free and free indeed because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and because there's an empty tomb in Jerusalem. If you believe that, say amen.